Welcome to the second lecture on Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. In this lecture, we are going to be covering the introduction of the work. If you haven't seen the first episode, I covered the um, foreword um, to the book, which in fact didn't get into any of Hegel's actual um, words, um, his own writing, but um, with the introduction, we'll be diving straight into the Phenomenology of Spirit. So if you're caught up with the foreword, we're going to go straight into the introduction and start trying to understand this monster of a philo philosophical text. Now, to start, the introduction really sets the scene for Hegel in terms of his aim and his fundamental presuppositions. Um, and his aim and, and, and elucidating these fundamental presuppositions are essential to understand if you're going to understand the book as a whole. Um, he starts, if you read the introduction, he starts asking the question of if we want to know what is absolute, if we want to know what is objectively true, we have to start with cognition. We have to start with our own cognition and we have to understand the nature of our own minds um, to sort of understand the nature of the entities doing the positing, the nature of the entities who are desiring or who are attempting to understand um, the absolute or the entities that are trying to understand um, objective knowledge. So Hegel's main engagement is with the scientific community that has formed under Newtonian mechanistic presuppositions and also Kantian philosophy. Um, and so the language he's using is really directed towards and informed by um, first that scientific community and second that philosophical community. Um, and his main takeaway and his main point in the introduction is to make the quite strong claim that both objective knowledge, how we think of it, and absolute knowledge as we think of it are not objective um, or rather not external mind independent realities. Um, that both of these forms of knowing, um, the desire for objective knowledge and the desire for absolute knowledge, are things that come from within consciousness. They're things in which we are entangled with this object. We are um, a part of the becoming of this object. That if we are aiming to understand what is objective and what is absolute, we cannot think about these things as a type of pre-existing substance to which we are either um, stumbling upon and discovering without altering it or receiving as a type of passive medium. So here's a quote from, from the book. The whole project of securing for consciousness through cognition what exists in itself is absurd and that there is a boundary between cognition and the absolute that separates them. For if cognition is the instrument of a thing, certainly does not let it be what it is for itself, but rather sets out to reshape and alter it. If on the other hand, cognition is not an instrument of our activity, but a more or less passive medium through which the light of truth reaches us, then again we do not reach the truth as it is in itself, but only as it exists through and in this medium. End quote. So you can see from this quote what Hegel is trying to um, establish, which is um, basically a negation of two presuppositions which he comes to think of as perhaps structuring the scientific mind first and then the religious mind. So the scientific mind, he thinks, um, operates on this presupposition as if the absolute is just somehow out there or objective knowledge is just somehow out there um, and that our cognition is just um, an instrument which is um, developing to reach this in itself. But he's saying that, of course, 
if the instrument is or our cognition as an instrument is um, searching for the absolute certainly searching for an in itself which exists independent of that motion is um, illogical to think um, that our very activity our cognitive activity would transform this in itself in the search for it um, and then he's saying basically about sort of like probably more the religious mindset that um, the absolute is this type of medium which just um, like he says the light of truth reaches us or hits us and 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 in that sense um, we are not involved in the revelation of the absolute the absolute just exists as it is um, and we just are the sort of contingent recipients of its self-revelation to us and so he's going to be arguing against these two two views so on the one hand here you'll see scientific consciousness on the other hand you'll see philosophical consciousness and i just uh you can just imagine uh on the philosophical consciousness side the the, the life paths reproduced also what i'm just emphasizing here is the telos or the end process where you see uh, for scientific consciousness, this relationship between self-conscious logical understanding and external objective substance. And on the philosophical side, you see the same image, but just a bar through the sensual immediacy. And I'll explain what those two symbols mean. So on the scientific side, you can see, you can imagine that you have the self-conscious logical understanding, which would be communities of, of physicists, um, or chemists or biologists or any other scientists and then you have the external objective substance or the absolute to which they're trying to get an objective understanding um, and in this process um, the self-conscious logical understanding presupposes that one day it will reach this uh, uh, objective substance um, on the other side you have the philosophical consciousness um, mostly inspired by Kant where basically you have the same process but Kant is saying that we are barred from ever reaching external objective substance in other words we're barred from the noumenal in itself and we are just playing with our um, our own reason uh, the contradictions of our own reason and so uh, in this sort of in these two representations you can sort of see the two meta um, views of the absolute which Hegel is engaging with and basically trying to overcome Here's a quote. Science, just because it comes on the scene, is itself an appearance. In coming on the scene, it is not yet science and its developed and unfolded truth. Science must liberate itself from the semblance, and it can do so only by turning against it. For one thing, it would only be appealing against to what merely is, and for another, it would only be appealing to itself and to itself in the mode in which it exists in the cognition that is without truth. In other words, it would be appealing to an inferior form of its being, to the way it appears, rather than to what it is in and for itself. Continued. Science can be regarded as the path of the natural consciousness, which presses forward to true knowledge, or as the way of the soul which journeys through the series of its own configurations, as though they were the stations appointed for it by its own nature, so that it may purify itself for the life of the spirit and achieve finally through a completed experience of itself the awareness of what it really is in itself so to break down those two passages i'm going to break down first the passage derived from 76 and second the passage derived from 77. the passage derived from 76 is basically saying that if we think about the emergence of science um, we have to think about science not in terms of what it's telling us about the in itself the objective in itself say absolute space-time but we have to think about science as an appearance we have to think about the appearance of science in history um, and that the notion of science is itself an unfinished product it's itself an unfinished project so science as a notion is still evolving is still developing is still discovering about the in itself and when we think about the that discovery of the in itself 
we have to think about the involvement of the appearances and the scientists and the scientific communities in that revelation. Um, and he's making the important point that um, that the inferior form of science um, is only care, caring about being in itself independent of the appearance of science and that a higher notion of science would include these appearances and that what science lacks if it doesn't do this is both um, truth and basically becomes an insular community which ignores its historical and subjective constitution. And so it's just scientists talking to themselves instead of science as a part of the whole becoming of humanity. And then in 77, um, Hegel affirms what he thinks of science, which is the path of natural consciousness. So he's basically trying to articulate a science of consciousness in and, in and for itself, consciousness searching for the in itself, and to apply basically the methods or the mechanisms of science, which he emphasizes are just perpetual doubt and perpetual self-questioning um, as the journey of consciousness to find the in itself. Um, and that this process um, for spirit or soul is um, to be achieved in, in conscious awareness, that the in itself has to be for consciousness. So then you can see here different representations of the in itself um, and the way in which Hegel affirms his view. So in terms of scientific consciousness, you do have a being in itself, um, which is disconnected from knowledge for us. Um, but you have the presupposition that one day the knowledge for us will, in some sense, be reconciled with the being in itself. We will discover the in itself. Um, you might think of this in terms of, of quantum physics, in terms of the quantum void. Or you might think about this in terms of general relativity, in terms of the space-time um, um, manifold. Um, or you might think about it in evolutionary theory as um, fitness landscapes. Um, this would be the being in itself and science sort of, for Hegel, at least scientific consciousness, which is operating on the first order, um, presumes that one day it will reach this objective being in itself, which is just existing independently of us. Um, and then again, you see on the Kantian side, this same representation where you have basically the same presupposition, but just Kant is saying, we'll never reach the being in itself. It'll always just be knowledge for us. So that's just another representation of what I was trying to represent a few slides ago. But then this addition of the, the higher order consciousness for Hegel, what he's trying to articulate as a, a higher order science, is that knowledge for us and being in itself are entangled and that the revelation of being in itself is always already being constituted by knowledge for us. And so we're very much entangled, caught up in the process and that the appearance of science, say the appearance of um, quantum physics or the appearance of evolutionary biology is simultaneously um, for consciousness. It's always for consciousness. Mm, to quote, the object, it is true, seems only to be for consciousness in the way that consciousness knows it. It seems, this, it seems that consciousness cannot, as it were, get behind the object as it exists for consciousness so as to examine what the object is in itself, and hence, too, cannot test its own knowledge by that standard. But the distinction between the in itself and knowledge is already present in the very fact that consciousness knows an object at all. Something is for it the in itself, and knowledge or the being of the object for consciousness is for it another moment. Upon this distinction, which is present as a fact, the examination rests. So this is a pretty self-evident or self-explanatory um, quote, but just to emphasize again what he's trying to say here is that when we think about objective knowledge or the absolute knowledge, this is something that is... Um, it's present in knowledge for us. So he's saying that it doesn't exist before knowledge for us. Knowledge for us brings the being in itself into being. Um, that's not to say that there isn't um, some noumenal realm in a Kantian sense. Um, but this is not for Hegel what is what is interesting. What is interesting for Hegel is the fact that consciousness is interested in finding a being in itself. Um, 
and that there is an in itself for for our knowledge communities and that you're saying this is self-evident and if you accept this present if you accept this presupposition if you're with me this is and you're following me this is the presupposition on which this work will operate and and i will be trying to understand the consequences of this pre presupposition so here to get a full sort of overview of some of the main presuppositions that Hegel assumes about the absolute thing in itself. The first is that whatever being in itself is independent of us is not the uh, not what is being investigated. What he's investigating is the way in which being in itself is transformed by knowledge for us is part of that we are part of this revelation. Um, that our cognition is tied up in it. So again, what, remember if you remember back a few slides ago when he was talking about cognition as an instrument, he's saying if our cognition is a type of instrument, then our very investigation of the in itself will transform the in itself. Um, the second point is that when we think about absolute reality, this is a distinction being drawn by consciousness. So even if you think about religious subjectivity, which presupposes a God. What Hegel would say is that God as an absolute reality, as an infinity, um, is something that becomes an object of cognition and something that doesn't exist before cognition posits it. Cognition posits it or experiences it and that it's from the, it's from the very motion and the development of cognition which that absolute reality comes into being in itself. And um, from this, Hegel believes he is capable of doing a phenomenology of spirit in history which which invites us to think the coincidence basically between the eternal absolute truth and its historical appearance its temporality that simultaneously we have the appearance of absolute truth in in a temporal historical process so we can't just think one or the other we can't just think absolute eternity independent of its histor historicity and we can't just think of temporality independent of eternity that there's a coincidence of the opposites here and this is fundamental to understanding um, the becoming of spirit and a science of spirit here the supreme reality is what is in truth only the unrealized notion consciousness provides its own criterion from within itself so that the investigation becomes a comparison of consciousness with, it, with itself. For the distinction made above falls within it. In consciousness, one thing exists for another, i.e. consciousness regularly contains the determinateness of the moment of knowledge. At the same time, this other is to consciousness not merely for it, but is also outside of this relationship, or exists in itself, the moment of truth. Thus, in what consciousness affirms from within itself as being in itself or the true, we have the standard which consciousness itself sets up by which to measure what it knows. If we designate knowledge as the notion, but the essence or the true as what exists or the object, then the examination consists in seeing whether the notion corresponds to the object. Okay, so there's a lot there. So the first thing is that Hegel's saying that the supreme reality is the unrealized notion. And that means that he's saying the supreme reality is incomplete, it's unfinished, it's inherently indeterminate. So it's not that the absolute reality exists out there independently of us, already complete, already full. It's, it's that the only way in which we can make sense of history and our knowledge and our search for the absolute is to presume that our very involvement in it is part of its own becoming um, and that our notions are are very much wrapped up in it maybe our highest notion is it but our uh, and that and that is the supreme reality um, and then moving on from that um, he again emphasizes that um, the determinateness of this knowledge comes into being for and by the work of a consciousness um, and that it doesn't, the determinateness of the absolute doesn't exist outside of this, this collapse, if you want it. It's kind of as if, um, you know, Hegel is trying to describe or articulate the way in which the absolute is like the collapse of the wave function. That 
in itself, the absolute is just this indeterminate, incomplete, fuzzy thing, this chaos, and that through our work in history, through conscious awareness, it gains an existence, it comes into being. Um, so there's, I think, some pretty obvious parallels and, 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 and connections here with, um, with the logic of quantum physics in some way. Um, but that he's not just an idealist or not just thinking about the mind, he's thinking about the way in which the mind is caught up with objectivity in itself. And he s says this with the quotes about the moment of truth, um, that consciousness affirms this, this being in itself, um, and recognize it as, 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 as a moment of truth outside of itself. But it's, but, but that moment of truth outside of itself only exists and only comes into being because of the work it's doing itself. Um, and so in that sense, he doesn't negate, and at the end you can see this, he doesn't negate necessarily this idea of like a reflection correspondence principle for truth, that our knowledge in order to be true must correlate with something outside of ourselves. So like, for example, if we... Um, propose a, a hypothesis or develop a theory about the solar system or subatomic particles or or life, um, our knowledge has to correspond with the in itself in some way in order for us to know it's true. Um, and he's still saying that this holds in his analysis, but just that he's saying that that if we want to describe the becoming of spiritual history and 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 the way in which we're involved in that process, um, we have to understand this type of objectivity, which is in some sense emergent from our own work work process. So here you can see um, a representation of how Hegel conceives the becoming of absolute knowing. And if you want more details on absolute knowing, definitely go to the previous lecture. Um, but that it's really absolute knowing is like a perspectival shift. So it's a change in perspective of thinking. Um, where in the scientific mode of consciousness or in the Kantian mode of consciousness, the absolute, the being in itself is something that we don't have access to. Uh, it's something we may have access to in the future, um, but it's, on, it's in terms of our knowledge, in terms of our own knowledge for us, um, the concept and the object are incomplete, lacking, uh, empty, and, and, and failing ultimately be because otherwise we would be one with the absolute. Our knowledge and being would be one. Um, and what Hegel is saying in some sense with absolute knowing is that you can reach a perspectival level when you realize that the absolute being in itself is just a part of your own spiritual becoming when your knowledge and being in itself are in a type of motion with itself. And that this is not an, again, emphasizing from the previous lecture, and, and I emphasize watching that, is that um, it's not that the process ends, and I'll emphasize this again in the next slide, but just that um, you recognize that you're part of the absolute's becoming. Your work is essential for the for the revelation of the absolute. Your work is what brings the absolute into being, and that you're moving, you're flowing with this um, dimension of reality. To quote, but the goal of absolute knowing is as necessarily fixed for knowledge as the serial progression. It is the point where knowledge no longer needs to go beyond itself, where knowledge finds itself, where notion corresponds to object and object to notion. Hence, the progress towards this goal is also unhalting. And short of it, notes no satisfaction is to be found at any of the stations on the way. It is driven beyond itself by something else, and this uprooting entails its death. So this is a very interesting quote, and I suggest reading the whole passage. But what you see here is that um, Hegel's emphasizing that in the scientific and the Kantian mode of consciousness, you have this idea of like a serial progression where we're, we're always at a distance from the in itself. Um, and so we're just focusing on the progress of our knowledge. We're constantly trying to accumulate more knowledge to reach the in itself. 
Um, but Hegel's saying that consciousness is, is, this is a form of consciousness which is a lower level form of consciousness. And you can see this sort of with people in self-actualization or, or thinking about self-realization or self-help. They're always thinking that their, their best state or their highest self will be realized at some time in the future. They don't yet realize that it's right now, um, that their highest state of consciousness can be right now. Um, or consciousness can reach that level where where it's capable of experiencing that. Um, and that's what he means when he says that there is a point where knowledge no longer needs to go beyond itself, where knowledge finds itself in itself, and it, and the notion just corresponds to the object, and you're just in a flow, you can say, with the absolute. Um, and that uh, this is sort of like a, a necessary point of development for consciousness, that consciousness won't be satisfied until it reaches this point. And he talks about this in relationship to this idea that there's not just that we have a spatial intuition um, of our present moment just existing right now, but there's always this tempor temporality uh, which he puts on the level of the notion, the unrealized notion, and that sort of charges the present moment. It charges our spatial intuition with something higher, something where we want to go beyond our current self, and that we won't be satisfied until we're one with this, and then we're with the absolute. And he says that before that, in this process, that you know, in when you're at a distance from your ideal self, when you're not yet with the absolute, or you don't feel that way, you're not satisfied with the object or being in itself, you're going to have to go through spiritual deaths. You're going to have to metaphorically die, but yourself will actually die. You'll have to cut away parts of yourself in order to become, in order to develop the knowledge necessary to be one with, with being in itself. So here you see another representation of this absolute knowing, and you can see uh, on the top, again, uh, the same representation from our previous slides, and on the bottom you see a more dynamical motion of the of, of the absolute. So the first thing I want to emphasize again is that um, absolute knowing does not mean an end, but uh, the emergence of a new horizon of becoming, um, where you are just rolling with being in itself, and you are constantly discovering that you are an active agent in the creation of the absolute and the becoming of the absolute. And you can see here just this motion I tried to to um, image here with this idea of type of like a, a collapse um, of being in itself. That the self is this arrow, this agent, which is constantly taking the um, unrealized, the indeterminate of the present moment, the potential of the present moment, and transforming it into being in itself. Uh, it's making it objectively its own, and that's that's the work of spirit. Quote, In pressing forward to its true existence, consciousness will arrive at a point at which it gets rid of its semblance of being burdened with something alien, with what is only for it, and some sort of other, at a point where appearance becomes identical with essence, so that its exposition will coincide at just this point with the authentic science of spirit. And finally, when consciousness itself grasps this in its own essence, it will signify the nature of absolute knowledge itself. So he's just saying that before reaching absolute knowledge, um, consciousness in some sense is burdened by an alien otherness. So this could be scientific objectivity or the Kantian noumenal realm. That consciousness in some sense is, is constantly worried about this otherness which it can't know and which it feels like it will never know or at least won't know in its lifetime. Um, but Hegel said this is a sign that the consciousness is not yet at the level of absolute knowing, where it's it's unified with being in itself, and that uh, that 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 appearance will reach a point and can reach a point where appearance and essence coincide as one. And this is this is what for Hegel would be the, the developing a science of spirit of of getting consciousness to this level. Um, where consciousness grasps the fact that it's it's deeply connected with this. So you'll see here, uh, I try to represent this um, in a non-linear, higher order way, where, again, on for the scientific consciousness and the philosophical consciousness, you see the, the self-conscious logical understanding as arrows in relationship to some objective substance that um, will either be known in the future or which will never be known in the future but exists independently of us somehow, which is the Kantian version. And 
all of this changes with the Hegelian notion where you see the, 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 fuzzy, the, 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 the fuzzy circles are the sensuous immediacy. The, the, the stars are, is, the, is the, the being in itself, um, which, I'm, which, I'm, which important point I'm changing from external objective substance to extimate objective substance. That's not a word that Hegel uses, but it's an important psychoanalytic word. Um, developed in Lacanian tradition, which I think applies to higher order consciousness and which applies in uh, Hegel's system, which is a type of um, objective intimacy. It's not a objective absolute which exists independent of us, um, indifferent to us, but a type of objectivity that we experience, a being in itself that we experience intimately. Um, it's, it's an objective intimacy. Um, which is type of an exteriority, exteriority which depends on us as or we're a part of. Um, and you see here how um, we are always with this, um, whether we're aware of it, whether we have absolute knowledge or not, we're always with this. So we're in sometimes always circling with it. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to represent this here as a more circular in the present moment pattern than a, a type of teleological pattern where it's just this future which never arrives or or some future which will arrive in some some it's a future present and and its status in regards to knowledge is that you you know it you have absolute knowledge you know it right now but a feature of its a feature of it is its unknowability and that just means that that it the absolute in itself is 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 a no it's a known unknowability in itself in the moment um and 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 that is why there's an endless progress so here in the alteration of knowledge the object itself alters for it too to rate knowledge that was present was essentially a knowledge of the object as the knowledge changes so too does the object for it essentially belonged to this knowledge. Hence it comes to pass for consciousness that what it previously took to be the in itself is not an in itself, or that it was only an in itself for consciousness. So this is a really important passage, and it's a complicated one because Hegel's trying to articulate this dialectic, this emotion, this, this strange way in which we're tied up with the object. So he's saying that um, in the state of absolute knowing, as as your knowledge as as your knowledge develops the object changes um so what you thought was the object in the past is no longer the object but that's always the, that's always the absolute that's a part of the absolute's becoming it's a feature of it that's why it's a known unknowability um so just that it's like for example before the emergence of um before the emergence of our understanding of absolute space-time or before the emergence of our understanding of evolutionary history, um, being in itself for us was different. And it's not saying that the being in itself independent of us sort of came into existence with our knowledge, but rather there's a being in itself that's for us, that's objective for us. And that change, and that change is, um, so, for example, in the future, there could be some process we're unaware of, which is on the same level as a Copernican revolution or on the same level as a Darwinian evolution, which we don't, which we don't know about, but, but which will change being in itself for us and could change being in itself for us in dramatic ways. Um, and so this is the type of thinking which the higher order consciousness um, strives to understand and tries, strives to know because it, it's, it's very much something that we're a part of. <clears throat> and so here you can see um, what Hegel's trying to identify first on the left as how consciousness in itself, first order consciousness in itself, experiences this whole strange relationship between knowledge for us and being in itself. And you see on the other side how a phenomenological analyst, uh, 
who understands the phenomenology of spirit um, should be able to perceive and understand this this process. So it's the difference between how a first order consciousness experiences the absolute and how a higher order consciousness experiences the absolute. So um, the, the the first order consciousness experiences the absolute as a as a discontinuity. So like I was describing, um, you might say that there's a, a radical break or rupture where all of a sudden your knowledge changes and being in itself changes. And this is seen as precisely a discontinuity, as a change of selves, as uh, uh, what, I, what I used to think was being in itself is no longer being in itself. Um, and so, so it's like everything's changed. Um, and it might be experienced as a, as a quick rupture. Um, this can happen, this can happen in, in love. Um, this can happen in our lives. This can happen in politics. This can happen in families. This can happen just in, in, in so many different areas of our life where you're, where your knowledge changes as and being in itself changes for you. Um, but what Hegel's saying is that if you're a phenomenological analysis, if you're a higher, if you're thinking about higher order consciousness, you realize that um, it, this is a more continuous process. That um, that that the the self is kind of like a loop going through cycles, and and that it's all part of one process. And and what's seen as a big rupture for a first order consciousness is actually just part of many little. Um, moments, continuous moments connected to each one another as part of the self cycle, as part of the self cycle loop of its, of its, its fluctuation between determinacy and indeterminacy. So here, from the present viewpoint, the new object shows itself to have come about through a reversal of consciousness itself. This way of looking at the matter is something contributed by us by means of which the succession of experiences through which consciousness passes is raised into a scientific progression. But it is not known to the consciousness that we are observing. It shows up here like this. Since what at first appeared as the object sinks for consciousness to the level of its way of knowing it, and since the in itself becomes a being for consciousness of the in itself, the latter is now the new object. Herewith a new pattern of consciousness comes to the scene as well for which the essence of something different from what it was at the preceding stage. It is this fact that guides the entire series of the patterns of consciousness in their necessary sequence. So again, to emphasize, um, Hegel is basically saying that how first order consciousness experiences this process between knowledge for us and being in itself is that the previous object, the past object, what it thought was the being in itself, no longer becomes the being in itself, and it, and and the self consciousness experiences this as a discontinuous rupture in its being. Um, but that this is all this is all a part of a necessary logical sequence, and so the crucial thing to to focus on is that first order consciousness experiences this very like illogical jumps, illogical ruptures that it can't make sense of fully as the whole process. But a phenomenologist should be able to elucidate the logic of this process, the becoming of absolute knowledge. Um, and that is what we will focus on very intensely in the next lecture. But um, that is basically the introduction. And so if you were following along, we covered um, some basic and some fundamental presuppositions that Hegel puts forward in the introduction to the phenomenology of spirit, which are essential for understanding the book as a whole. And if, um, and if you sort of understood the basic presuppositions we just covered, it will be enormously helpful for you to understand the future lectures. So I highly recommend um, taking notes or, or watching it again if you need to, if you plan on following this whole series. But, and other than that, I just want to thank um, so much my Patreon supporters. Um, thank you so much for, for being with me these past um, few months and for helping me get this channel started. And if you want to help me grow as I continue to cover Phenomenology of Spirit and other uh, great philosophical works. Um, the best way to do that is to become a supporter on on Patreon and to get in touch with me directly um, if you want to make uh, recommendations about the future of this channel.
So thank you so much for watching. If you're still with me, uh, boxes will appear around my head where you can watch other lectures or check out my Patreon page or subscribe so you get notifications when I upload a video. Thanks so much.